Okay, it's past six thirty. Can we uh, call the order? Okay, first thing is, do we have any observers that are making comments? No. to approval of the minutes of the last regular meeting, June 14th. Can I have a motion to approve the minutes? Motion to approve. Second. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Yes, there's nothing. Director's report. All right, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Nice to see all of you. Uh, I don't really have much. Um, a lot of this is self-explanatory. I don't mean to expand. A little bit, but um, just a positive note on the per capita grant, we were due to receive a little bit more than last year, and which was a little bit more than the year prior. So, so that's a good sign. Um, and then just a, a note about the ARPA funds. I mentioned that last month that we was, we have uh, two hundred fifty thousand earmarked by the village for the library's use. And we're starting to generate some ideas. Very early stages on all that, so nothing concrete, but. Keep all of you informed of um, so, kind of where that's headed. So, if you have any ideas or share with you in the community that um, you know, seems of interest, please let me know because we're, we're in that kind of uh, exploratory phase for that. What are they supposed to be used for? Really, anything related to um, serving the community um, and helping people after COVID. You know, so okay. it's very open ended. What does it need to be spent by? I believe 2024. Yeah. Okay. So we have a little bit of time. Okay. That's really it. And the rest is, if you have any questions about any of the rest of it, I can go into it further. Questions on, I'm sorry. on any of the director's report, the rest of it. I'd be happy to talk more about it or answer any questions you have. Know. Just under personnel, I just wondered what's our maternity leave policy? Um, our, we have a parental leave policy that allows just eight weeks. Leave. Well, it, it, no, yeah. I understand. I understand. It's paid parental leave, um, mm -hmm. so that's eight weeks of time, pay time off for um, any new parent of a newborn or a adopted child. Mm -hmm. Or is there a time? I mean, is there a it, period of time? Within a year, they can, I think it's within a year, they can use eight, up to eight weeks. And it doesn't have to be continuous, it can be as needed. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, sure. So, this is a, a professor in um, Korea who has a connection with us and has had one over, I don't know, maybe five years where they asked for uh, to send Korean students here to just see and experience the folk life in the US. So um, this is a new batch of students, and they'll spend, uh, I believe, the equivalent of like two days here, two, maybe two or three days here. And then um, this year, I worked with. Of other, a few other libraries in the area, North Brooklyn, Crown, Indian Trails, to have half days or full days at those libraries as well, just so they can get a variety. Yeah. And the question I had will they get any um, information about the structural issues around administration, like the board? And yeah, I, that's part of the itinerary um, with them and give them kind of a taste of. Administration and operations, and they'll also shadow different parts of human service, different parts of the library services. Of course, yeah, yeah. Just let me know. Shoot me an email and I'll arrange for a meeting to look into them. I'm just on a roll. All right. <laughs> um, under well, this really gets to the disbursement report, but under landscaping, I just wondered what whether we have a system about the maintenance of the sculptures, or is that the village's responsibility? The village green uh, sculpture, is that what you're talking about? Yeah. 
Yeah, that's the village's uh, responsibility. It's okay. the village we need, but yeah. All right, I'll contact them as a time <laughs> thing. <laughs> because they're, they're, we need to make it. Thankfully, that's not my area of expertise <laughs> or, responsibility, or my responsibility. But I'm happy to make a connection for you people. <laughs> yeah, because I just, I mean, some of it is the kids are coming to be here at the library, but they're outside, they're playing. They treated they treat the sculptures as a jungle gem, and I've had mm -hmm. yeah. like three instances now where I had to be a teacher and go and go step down, mm -hmm. stop that noise, look at it. and people are going thank you, <laughs> you know, but it's yeah. but they're stuffing up the sculptures. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? On the okay, next. We have the disbursements bills. Questions or comments on that? On, on, no, what okay. I, on questions on which part of that? The uh, bills, the uh, dis disbursement report. I asked Richard my question. Okay, no questions or comments? Okay, can I have a motion to approve the June 20, uh, 2022 disbursement? So moved. Okay, a second. Second. Okay, we have to do this individually. Yes. 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 So you stop just gonna point to the <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Next the uh consent agenda. Questions or comments about that? I know it's the gate counter's coming up now. Yeah, the control of the circulation is the right I wonder, with something's changed on the website. Remember, I was so complimentary because it was true that you could find the research section so much easier than before. And now I can't find it anymore. So now I'm not sure whether something changed in the layout or what, but it, it's like if you're in your account, then trying to get back to the main menu and get to research and get to the particular parts of research has become really laborious all of a sudden. I can take a look at that with you maybe at a break or something. Yeah. Maybe it's don't think any major changes. So, um, page 27, the tax yes. collection statements. Yes, that, um, that's the next part of the agenda. Yeah, okay. if you want, I mean, I can answer that, but I don't know if you want to take it specifically. Yeah, but, so we're on the uh, consent agenda, so we'll get to whatever else. Um, I noticed that the bookmobile is still way, way down. Have a that's that, I know this question has come up before. I mean, I think we're unfortunately experiencing some of the same conditions. You know, people, the bookmobile was um, not allowing, we weren't allowing people on the bookmobile um, for a long time, and now we are. So it, that's, it will take some time for people to get aware of that and get to that. Um, Should have been all that. Yeah. yeah, it has been. It's been. It's definitely been communicated. I'm not saying that it hasn't. But it went after two years. Also, so yeah, I say it again. <laughs> we need a jingle on the bookmobile. <laughs> I'm telling no, you, not and we will, we will work on that. But um, I never give up. I know. That's okay. I, I I appreciate that. Um, but. But uh, another part of it is, you know, some days the bookmobile is just um, out of service or um, staffing has been um, in flux with the bookmobile. We're getting now to the point where we hired the local staff, but also when new staff have to learn how to drive the bookmobile and get their license. They're, they're great. They're, I hear very positive things about their progress, but you know, there are certain limitations around the bookmobile's uh, service that we just can't. Well, you know, whether it's mechanical issues or staffing issues or whatever, it's 
not as easy to just plug someone else into a into a think over on your staff, you know, it might not be just enough. That you know, even a, a couple of stops or one day could decrease the money significantly on paper and stuff. And I know you need a combination of skills, right? Yes, to, it's, to do that it is well. a very difficult uh, position to fill, honestly, and because they need the customer service skills and right. also the driving skills. And like I said, we're fully staffed now, and we're very happy with the group that we have. And I, I expect our real articulation to improve moving forward. But it is just kind of what it is. And, we also still are just getting back and hearing our private staffs that the, the schools and daycare, so not the public published ones, but for organizations. Yeah. Uh, we've been doing some, but not as many as we just did. just started now. going back to some of the schools recently. And, uh, and that's what I was going to say yeah. is that, you know, we knew that like Mondays was the day, yeah. you know, so right. all the kids came out, they were dismissed after school, the parents met them. And the, Caregivers met them at the park and they knew right outside of school the book would be able to be there. So you have students who, you know, had that routine and that could kind of carry over through the summer, but since it wasn't really there in the last years, I don't really think, you know, it's hard to set those kinds of routines in place for kids when you have to build it back up. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. But I'm I am i am really happy with the group that we have on my staff and they're, I think they're doing a fabulous job. I don't want the numbers, uh, the circulation numbers, to be the whole story. I, I don't. I don't believe that's the case here. You know, there was, I would tell you, but I, I really feel like the football is still valued. People love the football uh, It's just COVID was very disruptive for, for that particular service, but, as well as obviously all library services. But that in particular is a But is there any way to track? Computer and access. Jane is here, and she'll talk a little bit about um, kind of our, what, our virtual yeah. engagement with people using our catalog and searching. Yeah. Yeah. And well, maybe I could ask you. Yeah, let's say one of question is for Jane. She'll, she'll do a presentation. And I'll introduce Jane in a second. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions on the consent? We have a motion to approve the consent agenda. So motion. Okay, second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And it passes seven nothing. Uh, next is presentation data. Yes, so Devin Brunson is our data analyst. Data analyst analysis coordinator. I always have the whole thing. I just want to say data analyst, but you're the analyst analysis coordinator. Devin has been with us a number of years. I think many of you have met her before. Obviously, you see her work in every board packet. Um, she's the person who is making all the data um, accessible, easy to understand. So um, she's terrific. She's here today because um, uh, at a strategic planning meeting recently, a few months ago, she gave a presentation to our strategic planning committee on the basic demographic. Um, updates on Skokie and just some library usage data. So um, I think I believe at some point the board asked that uh, we have that presentation or a version of a short version of it where the presence here today. Evan, take it away. Well, uh, we just connect really quick. Um, we have a couple of things that we Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some census data, the most recent release of the census data, as well as some library data um, that we have. So I'm going to start with the census data. This is the American Community Survey from the most recent releases in 20. It was released like within the past year, but it's from like the range of 2015 to 2020 uh, at this level of data. Um, I do have one disclaimer about everything I'm going to show you. The data is all aggregated for Skokie as a, as a whole. Um, as I'm sure most of us know, Skokie is not homogenous. These things vary depending on where you are in the community by far. Um, so just wanted to call that out before we get into this. Um, so the first piece of information is some demographic and housing estimates. 
Um, we have about 24,500 estimated households in Skokie, just as like a starting point for like what we have going on um, overall. Just wanted to get that number out. Um, and then I have some information on sex, age, and race. Um, Skokie as a whole means slightly more female than male. Um, and our median age is also 43. Um, compared to both Illinois and Cook County, um, the, our median age is a lot higher. Um, and as, you know, it's a kind of accepted fact that women live longer than men. Um, so some of my ideas of why we have more female than males is because our median age is higher. Um, so that's part of our demographics. And then for race, um, we have, I have a chart comparing to both Illinois and Cook County for Skokie. And then we have a lower population than both of those um, areas of white residents um, and a very, very high comparison population of Asian residents. Um, and then Hispanic is our next highest and Black or African American residents. Um, so that's kind of our general uh, race makeup uh, for Skokie. Oh, also, I'm going to kind of go quick because I've got a lot of data here. So if anybody needs to stop me to ask questions, feel free. Will uh, you be able to get copies of the slides? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Um, so here's some information on our foreign born population. This is a number that I pull pretty frequently. Um, for Skokie, we're at 38% of our residents are foreign born, um, which is much higher than both Illinois and Cook County. Um, and then what I have in this chart as well is some data on speaking different languages. So people that speak a language other than English at home is pretty steady across all of Illinois. It's about 88%. Um, and for Skokie, it's almost 89, but pretty steady. Um, and then the next piece of data is speak English less than very well. And these are, um, this is a self-reported number. So as you're filling out the census, you report whether or not you think you speak English very well. Um, and that number is, about 42% for Skokie. Uh, uh, and then the limited I, English. I read this correct, 88% Skokie as well as Cook County. No, this is just their foreign born population. Oh, of the foreign born. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. I wrote so that down as like, cool. holy cow, I was like, wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but that's still probably, yeah. 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 that's still probably 30% of our population overall that speak English, a different language than English at home. So um, we have to figure for uh, of the total population of Skokie, how much, how many speak uh, uh, language other than English at home? Just one second, I might. In our last Capital Technology Plan, it said over 70%. Yeah, so I have a different table back here that's really complicated, but it's 49% of people speak a language other than English, but it's not a language other than English at home. We only have that for this measurement. Um, so we have about 50% of Skokie is bilingual. The next piece of data is on educational attainment. Um, this chart shows both the percentage of residents that have achieved this education level and then next to it, the median income for those people with that uh, education level. Um, one of the most interesting pieces of data in this table is that even though Skokie has the percentage wise has a higher percentage of people with both bachelor's degree and graduate degrees. Our median income for both of those compared to Illinois and Skokie is lower overall by about 5,000. Uh, so it's pretty significant. We have a lot more educated people, but our educated people compared to Illinois and Cook County are making less money, um, which I thought was kind of just a fascinating. And for our employment status, we also have um, a pretty low unemployment rate. And keep in mind, this is pre-pandemic data, so this could be very different now. Um, but I would assume trends hold. Um, 
um, to stay lower than the other locations as well. Uh, and then the second chart on there is pretty interesting, showing the number of unemployed people who are at or above poverty level and below poverty level. Um, I don't have the answer to this question, but it's a question I like to pose is, are these people living in poverty because they are unemployed or are they unemployed because they're living in poverty? It's just kind of an interesting thought experiment, um, but our rate is lower than both um, other locations. Yeah. This is um, this is some information on residents that have access to the internet by um, like income range. So across, um, sorry, let me look at my metric. So compared to both Illinois and Cook County, Skokie across the board has a higher percentage of households with access to internet, which is great, um, and with computing devices. And that's pretty evident in the middle range right here. Um, which only 11% of our households are without uh, an internet subscription compared to 18% in both other locations. Um, but for the most part, across the board, a lot of people have access to the internet. Um, and then last but not least, this is access to computing devices. Um, across these three locations, we have the highest access to computing devices. This includes um, access to like a phone, cellular data is a computing device. Um, and we have the highest percentage. Obviously, it's very close, but still very high. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to move into some library data now. Um, so, if anybody has census questions, please. Let me know. Um, Again, this data is from 2016 to 2020. Yeah, it's 2015 to 2020. It's like, yeah, an estimate taken across those, um, that time period. I think my question is, it's obviously I only need to answer it today, but I think if we think about planning for the future of the library, are there ways to project like population and demographic changes over time? Like how that's going to be shifting to make sure we're planning for that in the future? Well, so, the good news is that we do have, or we have the most recent census data that just came out, but we don't have any of this like in-depth information. Like I have, I have the Skokie breakout of what our population was for the most recent census, census and um, race information, I believe. But that's like pretty much all they have right now until the next American Community Survey, which has more detail. But we can continue to look at. It. I think it's good to like just you know be very forward-thinking and understand how populations might change. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So, question about following up. You just filled out that American Community Survey right? in the last year. I remember filling it out online. Oh, did that? Yeah. When does that data come out? Um. Well, if the 2015 to the 2020 stuff just dropped, okay. I would assume that it does not <laughs> come out for a while. Um, um, okay. Unfortunately. <laughs> not even uh, high level. No, they don't. They don't send it out until it's uh, completely aggregated. Yeah. Uh, so, moving into some library data, um, I'm only showing fiscal year 2021 and 2022. I know that you've all seen longer term data in the report that I send out. Um, this is just a little bit more helpful to focus questions, conversations on like what we are doing currently and like what the state of the library is now. What's been going on during the pandemic? So um, this is a visual representation of what our circulation has looked like for the past um, 24 months. Obviously, we have the very beginning of the pandemic over here, um, and just like the, it's pretty steady now in fiscal year. Well, last fiscal year it was pretty steady, but you know there's still a general trend. If I were to put a little trend line on there, it would definitely be up. It's still going up to the right. Um, so this is what we like to see both in May and June. Our surf has been up. Um, Laura, do you recall if it's the highest it's been in June and July? I can't recall. I think July was the highest it's been so far for surf. Me too. Yeah, yes, thank you. <laughs> June. Um, if it was not the highest, then it was right yeah. there. Yeah. It's the highest. Um, for sure, the Olympic too, but um, yeah. it's definitely trending upward. Yep. Um, 
So this is our e-resources circulation. Um, the dark color is the year 2022, um, so last year, um, and that's it has dropped compared to this year 2021, but we've seen obviously a big um, spike in our physical circulation. So a lot of this, you know, this year 2021 circulation is people couldn't physically come to the library, so they were checking out our e-resources. Um, and bear with me for a second, I'm going to kind of get mappy. If you look at fiscal year 2022 compared to fiscal year 20, you skip fiscal year um, 2021, the like trend over time is like steady. So last year is actually an outlier when we look at the data um, and we're still increasing compared to pre-pandemic times, uh, which is also positive um, to see. So question yes. for three on that. So my understanding is that we partially run that. Do we still count when we automatically renew? Yeah. We count that as part of circulation? Yeah, for physical circulation. Is there automatic renewal we, for e resources? Not for e resources. Yes, it is. For physical renewals have always been counted as part of circulation. Yeah, they always um, have. But there may be more now because of the automatic. Somebody who might not have in the past renewed something right. may get it automatically renewed yeah. and then return the next day. We don't know. But that started pre pandemic. Yes. That wouldn't be reflected in this. Automatic paper. renewals actually started right at the beginning of the pandemic. Yeah. Is there some way to see a subset? Because you know, get, it's really nice. I personally like the service of having the automatic renewal, but I'm just curious, like, how much is people actually borrowing resources? Is there any way to get that subset number? Yeah, I mean, I can remove checkouts compared to renewals. Renewals, yeah. yeah. I'd be curious to see that. Yeah. I have a question about declines and spikes. Like, sure. I'm I. In my professional capacity, I work with like products and I understand, you know, like during certain holidays and you know, mm -hmm. you can kind of correlate that. I'm curious if you have an understanding of like why you know, like during the month of May seems to always be like our highest surf amount, and then in January we see this big spike with like a dip in February. I'm just curious, does that correlate to like library programming, time of year? Like, I don't know, is there a general sense of why those things happen? Well, so the January spike is winter months and uh, at least for fiscal year 2022 that was the peak of omicron um, okay. so you know part of the reason for that spike is covid yeah. concerns I, I would also say um because these numbers are lower overall so they're happening in the 20,000 the number of days in the month can matter a substantial amount because okay. you get a certain number of people at checkouts every day on average, so you lose three days between January and February. Mm -hmm. it, it does often cause that dip in February. Okay. Um, yeah. And so it's just, it was, it's, it's curious to me, like, oh, that's that's interesting. Because then I think, oh, if certain months have lower circulation than other months, could like additional library programming or marketing efforts mm -hmm. or things like that be used during those kind of dips? So that's the reason I was yeah. I mean, for the most part, I would say a majority of our data is very cyclical. I don't know the reasonings for everything that's happening, but I will say that for the most part, days of week, even months, like it's very, I can look back a few years and be like, that's pretty steady, you know, for the most part, um, just with like peaks and uh, valleys and stuff like that. So, yeah, thanks. I'm a data nut too. So. <laughs> <laughs> I really like it a lot. lot so. Um, <laughs> so, here's a little bit of a programming overview. I, um, You've seen the programming data I send that to everybody every month. So I just wanted to show a little picture of a piece of data that you don't see every month. Um, so we have the attendance per program stat, which is just helpful to look at, even though there's like, there's changes in peaks and valleys of both um, the number of programs and the attendance of programs. For the most part, like we have a pretty steady or an increasing number of people at all of our programs. Um, it's not like we're offering less programs and less people are coming, you know, like there's none of that happening. It's still like we have a, a pretty substantial amount of people coming to all of our programs um, for each um, for each age group. So that's just a snapshot of that. Um, and here's a little snapshot of our YouTube events YouTube channel. Um, not the main YouTube channel, just the like where some programs are posted. 
I just I like to point out there's a huge spike in our adult event views. It it contains a lot of things on like technical um, videos and videos on things in the studio, like the sewing machine. Um, so people are very interested in that. That has thousands of views. Um, everyone. I think it's interesting. So if you go back to the previous slide, it looked like there was a dip year over year with adult in person attendance, and then you go to the next slide. There's an increase in yeah. adults, so it seems like people have shifted potentially the way they absorb information or yeah. events. For sure. Yeah. I think you can see that with YouTube dipping. You know, when there was no choice but to buy yes. story time on the computer, yes. that's what people did. Now there is a choice and you can do things in person, and that still works. Yeah. So grand adults have found the flexibility of watching whenever they can. Right. Um, Kind of in the programming realm still. Um, we have some data on the studio um, for the ELS spaces. Um, let me, I'm sorry, my notes are all jumbled. Let me get to the right page here. Okay, so um, we have steadily increased in the studio in terms of attendance over time. Um, it's uh, pretty. Yeah. linear there um, and our space tour is the highest number but that's you know we were doing tours this is a brand new space so we had a lot of people coming in to drop in and check out the space but um, our most popular uh, equipment in there is our laser engraver and the sewing machine um, which is pretty cool to see just you know the breakout of everything we have but everything has a pretty steady usage per month and pretty sure people are using stuff a year is pretty good still so uh, as it doesn't have May so it's only 11 months of because we didn't we weren't open at night so um, the boom box as well all the pictures of the ELS spaces are pretty everything's consistently increasing as you know COVID um, concerns change and uh, awareness of the spaces change as well so um, pretty strong increase June are pretty steady actually overall, um, but we had about 9,000 people use the moon box um, since it opened. And for the use lab, uh, activity is a bit different. There's been a slower increase since it's open, um, but they are opening it up to more computers in that space and um, just you know kids attending are different. A little bit different than the other spaces. Um, and an overall picture of gay count. Um, obviously, it has increased like triple um, since last year and it's steadily increased. I think both May and June of this year are highest that it's been each, each month. Uh, separately, it's been the highest gay count since um, the pandemic started. So we're still trending up there. And uh, so cards issued, I just, I like to include this piece of data just because it does show like, even during the height of the pandemic in fiscal year 2021, we were still issuing a lot of cards. We were still issuing cards to patrons. Patrons were still coming interested in the library. Um, and the October and November spikes, um, there are the school library cards as well as um, since there was a new mover campaign that we had, uh, we sent out postcards to new residents of Skokie. Um, so there's a lot of uh, a lot of new cards being issued to the community. Uh, and then, all right, that's it. Kind of flew through it. So thank you. Yeah. Does anyone have any uh, questions? Yeah, I have a question really for both of you. Uh, ladies, is there a figure or some method of measuring each month how many times the programs and the collection is accessed on the computer. In other words, what I'm looking for is we have the gate count. We know how many books are drawn out, but since COVID, people are using the computer more to check up on things. And what I would like figure out a way to measure over time how often patrons uh, access
access what we do in, in programs as a collection on a monthly basis and see if it's going up or down some measurable uh, trigger we can do. Are you asking specifically about like I'm just going to use the word clicks, like clicks on the website, like going to the programming page on our website. Is that what you're asking? Well, if it, it would be programs in the collection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. I don't see why not. Um, right? I think we have we have access to that data. Um, yeah, we have Let me jump in here. Um, the YouTube um, uh, views is a major representation of programs online, so that's our data. Funded for that for the most part. Uh, as far as collections is concerned, or if you're talking about digital collection, the like books, streaming, that kind of thing, or that, just that's all that paper back books or paper books. Right, so people go to look at their collection, see what you have. In, in the so using the yeah, catalog, the catalog. Yeah, yeah, we, the we can get catalog. capture that information yeah. so there's kind of um, an indicator of how many people are using it on catalog, but then there's an indicator of how many people are. Using digital collections, which is represented in our e resources data every month. Yeah. Why? Because it seems to be you know, COVID changed everything in terms of how people access a library. And I think today they access the library more through their computer. Maybe they don't want to show up to a place. Maybe they're a little fearful of it. I don't know. So, what I want to be able to do is you know, capture that. So, uh, a, a figure or of data that we can take a look at well, what they do in January, what they do in February, and measure that over time. Just like we measure gate count, or how many books are withdrawn, or how many ebooks are taken out. We can measure that over time. We, let's let Jane give her presentation too, because I think she'll okay. have some of that. I, have, I don't know if this data could be, I'm curious about it and how it could be used. So when I think, I think there's a big difference between the number of people that use the library versus like how engaged they are with the library. So I was curious if it's like gate count is up, we have more people in, is, are more people checking out content or is it a select group of people? People who I'll just call them power users of the library who are like super engaged. Uh, I think it, I think when we think about attracting, say, a customer, you're attracting a, a patron <laughs> to the library, a guest to the library. It's about making sure they feel welcome and comfortable here, and making sure that they stay like that level of engagement is really important. So I don't know if there's like a, a barometer or some type of metric where we can not only measure the quantity of people, but like how much they're using. The that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. I, I don't yeah, yeah. know a way to quantify that, but I think that would be a, a good measure. Yeah. To do. Yeah. I mean, so I can get. I mean, there's data that I can get on like unique users, um, and then I, you know, there's counts that I can get on how many times that unique user used. Yeah. I, know, like, I think that would thirty be, plus. Yeah. Use yet. I think that'd be great because if we can start to see there's more unique users coming to, I mean, I think that gives a truer read of like how much the library is being used, you know. And to that, but I, I'm going to piggyback yeah. off of that because that was kind of where I was going in my mind was the programming. I know that we had talked a little bit about the programming. Like, do we have our frequent families that are consistently signing up for those same programs and how many of them? Just keep coming back, which is great because we know that they're those power users or our regulars, right? But then, um, how many times can we get new cardholders to come in and engage, sign up, register for a program? Um, any other patrons that want to come in that are new to the programs, right? So we have our same, let's say, you know, some of those numbers for like the adults with like sixteen. Or nine, right? So, like, are they the same nine? They keep coming back to the same programs, right? Or, are is it nine new ones every single time? Or is it three of the same ones and six different ones? You know, and how can we be reaching out so that we don't we're we're having more for you know more of our patrons as opposed to just the same ones all the time? Can I mention the active the number that's in the report? I, that, isn't that a little bit 
it? Yeah, I'm done eating. Like, you can say about the one that's that number. Sure. Yeah. Well, I don't expect you to do it it was more of a discussion point. I'm just thinking yeah, about like yeah, how yeah. I was just gonna look at what I yeah, called yeah. it because I couldn't remember. What I'd like yeah. you to do is come back <laughs> on two months or some some period of time. And there's really three things we're looking at. It's how often people are accessing programs at the collection, uh how the, the percentage of power users versus one-time users. And the third thing that's very important, and maybe that's not your expertise, but how do we get more people in the village to use the library? How do we reach them so they start using the library? I mean, that seems to me to be three major things to work on. I would sort of have a sub-question. I don't know if it's possible, but you started out talking about demographic scope, including poverty level, income level, education. Any way we can tell our users for what, like, if it's an equity issue, do we get to the poor people, the lowest, are we providing for them what they need? Do we have any way of knowing? In the past, I've done, I don't know if this ever got to the board, but I did the, um, I did a neighborhood profile by census tract, yeah. and like, I can plot our patrons into where they live, and then kind of extrapolate information based on their census tract, right. but we don't collect information on our patrons to that level, so I don't have specifics. Um, you did also like this before. Okay, good. So very helpful. Yes. To that and change it to come, you know, to ask another leading question along those lines is, you know, if we are not reaching some of those demographics, what are the roadblocks and barriers, right? So, what are the things that we can be doing to investigate those? You know, one of which, like I know we had talked about, you know, could it be a transportation issue? Could it be, you know, a language issue? What are the barriers that are that are occurring, and what can we be doing to to rectify? And I, I mean, this is like you know, a very deep question, right? That like we definitely, if we, if it was that easy, we would have answered it by now. But like to continue our ongoing research um, into that. But the first step of doing is getting the information and understanding. Why. Yeah. I appreciate all of your comments and suggestions. I think that this is really helpful, not just for us to think about data, but ultimately for strategic thinking. You know, I'm thinking of our strategic plan. You know, what I'm hearing from the board, which is the primary representation of the community for us, you know, is how do we reach um, people who are not using the library, perhaps underserved? How do we how do we examine how effective we are in reaching the most vulnerable and the most in need in our community? How are we shifting our strategies to post COVID in terms of how we reach people virtually versus buildings? So these are all really good. It's helpful for me to take this in. Thank you. Okay, so what I wanted to know is something. So, in addition to the circulation number, we have another figure for the computer. Okay, so how many people are accessing the library in that way, in that manner? And are they the ones that? Power users or are they are single users? And something we can measure on a monthly basis so we know how well we're doing in terms of uh, how many people outside of the people in the gate count are reaching, uh, how many people beyond the power users we are reaching. And then the other thing, which is really Crosses over every department. How do we get the ones we're not reaching? How do we reach those people? So those three things I would like to see. And I don't care if it's next month or two months or three months, but it's going to require a lot of thought, and it's going to require something to come up with. What's the best way to measure this? You no, know, we're trying to measure. 
there's going to be different ways of measuring it. So if we're relying on you to come up and tell us what's the best way, or if there are a series of ways and we select one or two of those. I think that I understand and we always try. We're, well, this is good at uh, feedback. We're I've interrupted James. Well, she we hasn't even begun yet. So, <laughs> so, um, so um, are we done with Devin then? Or? Thank you so I Thank love you. the data. Devin, do you want to stick it around for Great. James for the oh, session sure. too? Yeah. And then after that, you're free to say or? or well. So, Jane, Hannah is our community engagement. Community engagement. Community, oh my God. Communications. communications and multimedia engagement. I'm sorry, I just can't get title like this. Jane works here. She's a, she's a staff member. Uh, now, Jane's been here with us for years and um, started off as kind of managing our social media presence for the most part and doing a lot of writing and editing. And she's um, she was promoted to the management position a few years ago. Behind all the communications efforts that we have, online, social media, design work, uh, James heading that up. So I think we're going to James here. I don't think James uh, presented to the board recently, so for, it might be the first time meeting in this with the uh, board. Do you want to be? I think you know the board, but we can go around. I, if you I want. do. I'm, I'm responsible for all of your portraits. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all of them. Yes. So she studies your projects. <laughs> We asked Jane to come here today to um, just provide a summary of um, some background on her work, her team's work, and just so the board has a bit of a greater understanding. Yeah, thank you, Richard. Um, and you know, I was taught when you come to somebody's house, you bring gifts. So <laughs> I have some things, and you might have all of these already. The most important is my handout for tonight that covers some of the things we're going to talk about. But um, I have our little flying book squirrel magnet, very popular. We've been having these out um, this summer. I have the latest newsletter, which I'm very proud of and excited to share with you. Um, and underneath that, I have our bookmobile paper craft, it's a DIY I bookmobile. Saw the video. It's this is what the cool. finished product looks wow. like. But you can color it, you know, and decorate it and make it your own before you put it together. So if you want to help yourself to any or all of those things, but please do at least take the top hand out. Um, so Richard introduced me. And Covered the first paragraph of my opening remarks anyway, so I'll skip that. Um, yeah, I've been here seven and a half years, um, and CME, Communications and Multimedia Engagement, is a newish department. We're only about four years old. Um, it's easy to remember because that's how old my kid is. We formed the department while I was very pregnant. So it's like, new department, good luck with that, going on leave. Um, it's busy here. It was. Um, so I do have a background in arts marketing, communications, and digital strategy. Um, I've actually been working on social media for almost 20 years, which is wacky to think about. Um, I worked a long time ago for the Chicago Reader newspaper, and I was involved in uh, the personal ad department, and I was there when we converted from print to online ads, so transitioning people to online dating. Um, I also worked at the Field Museum for a number of years and set the social media strategy there, including um, being involved in the team that does Sue the T-Rex on Twitter. I've helped the lonely hearts and dinosaurs <laughs> career here, but I've been here seven and a half years. Um, and my team, like I say, we're fairly new, we're about four years old, but I'm, I'm just so proud of what we've accomplished. And I wanted to talk a little bit about what we do and the philosophy behind it and our approach to our work. Um, I want to share with you some of the things we're working on right now, some of the things that are on the horizon, and then hear from you what your, what your questions are, what your ideas are. I'm really excited. It's checking with you. So, um, what we do is set the brand strategy and the communications for the library. Um, that includes things like the print newsletter, obviously the website, social media, emails, physical and digital signage is something you might not realize that we are involved with. Um, it's installations in the building, things like some reading, uh, it's video and photography content, it's even our staff t shirts and promotional items are all things that we're involved with. Um, and for me, one of the most important things about the way we approach our work is that we start with listening. Um, we build our communication strategy in collaboration with library staff across departments because marketing, quote unquote, is actually what happens in every single conversation that takes place at the desk or in the call center or in an event. 
Um, so I want our communications to support and empower our staff to promote the library in each interaction that they have with the public. And I want our patrons to have a clear sense of ownership and ease in their relationship with the library. One of the best ways to build that fluency is for our communications to work so seamlessly that you don't even realize you're using them. Um, so that means that signs are placed in the natural spot that your eyes go to when you're looking for a piece of information. Um, that means that things are where you think they should be on the website, so you're not clicking around. So, Maureen, let's talk. <laughs> um, that means that you know about library services and collections and events in such a way that you're not even sure how the information got in your brain. You just feel like you always do. Um, so in a way, the better we do our work, the less you notice it. But the more relaxed you feel, because you're in the know, this is your library. You just get it. That's not to say that we strive to make things that are invisible or forgettable. We want you to be wowed by the beautiful and informative and engaging communications that we produce. We just want your takeaway to be something like, summer reading looks super fun and I can't wait to fill out my bookshelf. We don't want your takeaway to be, well, that's a cool ad. Right? Um, so there are many challenges <laughs> to sharing the story of the library when there's so much to tell. And the way that we approach that is to get very specific in our campaign. So I'm famous, you need to worry about <laughs> for asking two questions in every meeting that I never had. <laughs> Do you want to say what they are? No. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, my two questions are, who is the audience and what's the goal? And the reason that I ask that question is because our staff are experts in the community that we serve. So when I ask those questions, I get to tap into the most powerful market research tool and learn from my colleagues who are working directly with the various segments of the population about where they are. What do they need? What kinds of communications work for them? And how can we help? And when we can focus our goals and target our communications to those segments, that's when we have the most impact. Um, so the handout that I sent around shows you a little bit of what we're focusing on right now. This is just a sampling. Obviously, we're doing quite a bit more than this. But um, these are kind of key focus areas that have emerged, certainly since the pandemic and since the completion of the renovation, where we've really put a lot of energy um, in recent months and years. Um, the first being advisory and collections. You know, I think pre-pandemic, a lot of our communications were focused around events and promoting events, and we still do that. So this is a yes and, not an either or. But when we stopped offering events because of the, the pandemic, we had to talk about something else. And the obvious thing to talk about was our collections, what we were reading, and featuring our expert advisory staff online, giving book recommendations, sharing. That's been incredibly popular. Um, believe it or not, people want to hear librarians talk about books, and they want to talk about books themselves. So that's going to be like a staple of our communication strategy moving forward. And that comes through things like um, our new titles emails, which on the second page here of the packet, you can see an example. It's a printed email, so it doesn't look amazing. But it does look lovely when you see it in your inbox or on your phone. Um, this is an email that goes out monthly. We just started doing these again last month, so it's pretty new. Um, we offer a menu of different categories. Patrons can uh, select their options for themselves and completely customize it. And then we send you a really simple email that just has new titles in those categories that you've self-selected. It's been very, very successful so far. Um, as I said, we've only done two. The second one went out yesterday, so I don't have a ton of data. But I can tell you that so far of those two emails, you get results kind of within 24 hours. Um, our unsubscribe rates are less than 1%, 0.66%. And that's going out to 48,000 people. So it's remarkably popular and successful. People are clicking to update their preferences, they're customizing the content, they're really excited about it. So I, wait. Um, I want to mention summer reading this year too. It's also all about books because that's what everybody loves. So there's not a, a theme like space or camp or anything like that. It's just books. And people are really resonating with it. They're enjoying filling out that bookshelf. Um, they're enjoying wearing the t-shirts that Mary's modeling for us, asking us about those shirts. Um, so that's something we're tremendously proud of as well. Social media is also an area where we see a lot of success when we promote collections and advisory. We do something called Mini Match, which I mentioned in reports before. It's a really quick, rapid response version of Book Match, where you can 
send us a message on social media and we'll give you a personalized book recommendation nearly instantaneously. We're doing a quarterly now and they're great, great success. Um, we also did a recent series on Instagram called Get Caught Reading that featured staff holding the books that they're currently reading and giving a brief recommendation and review. We got a lot of engagement. Um, I didn't mention the current newsletter on here and I should have, but if you picked up a copy, um, you'll see that is very much focused on reading as well, promoting summer reading. There is a feature on the bookmobile in there. There's a spotlight about our third floor access team that shows you kind of the behind the scenes life of a library book before it gets to the shelf for you to check out. Um, there are also features in there on things like our hot cool summer reads recommendations for um, another focus area for us right now is connection, and that's been the case certainly always, but certainly since March of 2020. Um, many, many libraries chose to stop publishing their newsletters in the early days of the pandemic because it was mainly a conveyance for event information and when there were no events, why spend money on printing and mailing something? We didn't do that. We pivoted our newsletter to be something that was more of a magazine format, and we really focused on developing editorial content and narratives that would help people feel connected and share stories and make sure they were seeing smiling faces in photographs. Um, and that's been really powerful for us and something that we will continue to do. Um, we consistently hear from the community that the newsletter is meaningful. Staff that have been featured in the newsletter tell me that patrons come up to them and say, oh, I saw you in the newsletter. Um, the staff person who we mentioned has a pen collection and a feature came up and offered to will her his pen collection. <laughs> Respectfully declined, of course. Um, you know, so the newsletter is really special. It's always been special. It's always been one of our most effective tools for getting people to uh, register for events, but now it's something more. We're really committed to keeping that uh, on track. The one that's uh, coming out, well, I'll get to that in a second. I don't want to jump ahead of my agenda. I'll give you a preview of what September, October is going to be all about. Um, new mover postcards, which Devin mentioned, are another thing that we're working on that's been really interesting and successful. We send those out quarterly through a vendor partner, and they are um, individually addressed to new residents in the village. Now, what's interesting about individually addressed is our newsletter goes out to households through both mail through the, the post office. So they're addressed to residents. But the new mover postcards are individually addressed. Um, and they're specifically um, intended to reach people living in multi units and residential facilities who may or may not be getting our newsletter. We're sure the post office is dropping a stack of them off in the lobby, but they might not actually be getting them individually. But they should be getting the new mover postcard if, if they're a new resident. Um, and they're a friendly invitation to visit the library, get a library card, and see what we're all about. On the last page of the packet, I included um, a proof. This is not actual size, but this is the front and back of the newest iteration of the new mover postcard. We've been changing the artwork to reflect uh, the seasons. So this one will get mailed out actually next week. And it has some new photos of courtyards, the bookmobile, and people enjoying the indoor and outdoor spaces. This is, I didn't bring enough to share, unfortunately, but I can pass you um, This is the actual size and weight. But this is the wintertime artwork. Um, we're also doing a tremendous amount with email. We're sending out bi weekly emails every other week. Um, we're keeping them really short, really general, two to three feature stories and a few event highlights. Again, unsubscribe rates are laughably small. Um, Click through rates are highly contingent on what the content is, and it's always interesting to see what gets clicked on and what doesn't. Um, but it's, it's very edifying to me that even when people aren't clicking through, they're not unsubscribing. So it may or may not be something that motivates them to act, but they still want to be connected to us and they still want to receive messaging from us. Um, those emails come from Christy Robinson, who's our senior communication strategist. There's a reason for that. We don't want to send general library emails from a generic address um, because we want people to know that there are humans behind this correspondence and we want people to be able to respond to those emails and get a human who can reply to them. Um, they do. They respond to all emails with things like, can you renew my books? You know, <laughs> and Christy takes care of it. So that's a really important point I want to make about our emails. They're personal and individual. Um, we're also doing a lot with promotions and giveaways. Our, our colleagues in community engagement and patron engagement have, um, Gong gangbusters with events this summer. They're out at the farmers market. They're out at festivals, concerts. They're out at 
Wednesdays on the Green, and we're supporting them with fun swag, like I handed around, the magnets, um, bookmarks, craft. We also uh, recently acquired two event tents of our own that are in Library Teal, and they have the logo on them. So you'll be able to see the library booth from a good distance now. We'll stand out among all the white tents. Um, another focus area for us has been instructional design, and this is a somewhat unanticipated, unanticipated focus area that emerged upon completion of the renovation and also as um, the public health situation evolved. We need to teach people how to use the building and how to move about the building and what the behavior expectations are. There were many, many things about the renovation that we didn't anticipate, like um, the shelves right behind you there that have magazines and newspapers, there's back stock behind them. If you lift them up, you can get back issues, but folks weren't realizing that they could open them. Um, so we worked on a project to add some iconography and some simple instructions to the edges of those shelves. Um, things like operating the adult changing table on the first floor, operating the bathroom locks, um, successfully getting a paper towel to come out of the machine, things like that. Um, we spent a lot of time working on that. That's user experience, and that's why it falls under our team's purview. And back to my earlier point about you know comfort and fluency in the library. We don't want you to know that you were here in the sense that you struggled with something or something stuck out to you or you had a frustrating bathroom experience, right? Like we want it to be seamless. So we've been putting a lot of effort into that as well. Um, oh, and I skipped over, I'm sorry, the um, tour video series was something that we worked very hard on. Uh, it's a series of 10 videos that spotlight different areas of the renovated library and feature expert commentary from uh, staff who work in those areas. So we're really proud of those. And then finally, um, our other focus area right now is accessibility and inclusion. That's always a focus area for us. Um, we're always striving to make sure that our content is welcoming and that it's accessible and that it's inclusive and that it reflects the diverse voices that we serve here in the village. Um, so ways that we've been working on that in recent months are um, a number of changes to the website to streamline content and make things easier um, or perhaps more difficult. Won't have yet. <laughs> um, we worked on our accessibility page specifically to make that reflective of the enhancements uh, that resulted from the renovation. And we also did an additional video on top of the 10 that I mentioned that specifically gives a tour of the accessibility features of the physical spaces. Um, and then we're really looking at our work with a critical lens and deciding, are our images reflective of the community? Do we need to expand our access to stock photos so that we can be more representative of all people? So we subscribed, for example, to disability, uh, what's it called, sorry, disability images is a new stock photo repository that we have access to so we can um, better represent our community. We have conversations with every piece of writing um, to be careful about the voicing. If we're using the word we, who do we mean? Is there anyone that's left out by that we? Are there perspectives that are not included in that we? Who's missing and how can we bring those perspectives in? Those are critical conversations that we have on my team every day. Um, and we're also looking at things in terms of accessibility through language. And that can be for all sorts of reasons, English not being your first language, perhaps you're neurodiverse. There's lots of reasons why people don't read written words the same way as the person standing next to them. So we're trying to be cognizant of that. We're trying to evaluate the language or reading level and wherever possible, maybe don't use words, maybe use icons instead or use fewer words. So um, those are some of the four things that we've been focused on recently. And a few things that are on the horizon for us. Um, we're working closely with learning experiences on a series of videos to spotlight the technology in the studio, as you saw from Devin's numbers, sewing machines, going gangbusters. We've already done one uh, video about the sewing machine and it's putting up big numbers. So we're gonna follow suit, make that whole series and feature different equipment and software tutorials things that you can use in the studio suites. Um, the September, October issue of the newsletter I alluded to is uh, going to focus on the information services team. So the folks that work up here on the second floor we're going to talk about their talents. We're going to talk about the services that they provide and also spotlight technology that you can access on the second floor outside the studio. Um, and I'm really excited about that issue. We're just now putting that together. Um, we're also planning to relaunch our welcome series of emails. We did this pre-pandemic, pre-renovation. 
you're going to come back soon. Um, these are emails that new card holders receive to kind of onboard or orient them to the library, introduce them to services and collections, and really get them a good foundation with that fluency that I mentioned. So they feel really connected to the library and empowered to use it. Um, we'll be working on that this fall. And um, we're also considering uh, ways that we can do a better job of auditing our accessibility of our digital presence, whether that's with internal staff resources or an external consultant, we'd like to do an audit uh, of our website and see where we can do better. And finally, um, we're working with the teen services team, Laurel and I meet monthly um, to continue to explore new ways to engage teens and also young adult educators through digital communications. I actually spoke with Laurel right before this meeting, we talked to her and launched she said, um, that the teen interns have some new ideas for social media crossover, and I'm really excited to meet her about that. So that's an ongoing conversation. Yeah. The question that I have for you too, and just in terms of, of social media, like everybody uh, since I came, actually, you know, everybody always talks about, well, our social media and our this and our that and our the other, and I'm still trying to find half of that stuff, <laughs> you know. So I really. I think that what we're missing is um, that it's sort of like the um, uh, the WTTW they give you this, you know, here's what's coming, or any of those, what they call it, whatever the word is, where it, it tells you here are the different channels mm -hmm. and here's how you get to them. But what we need is here's how you get to them. I mean, you know, because even searching. If you if you go on and if you just if you don't put in the right search terminology, I'm not finding that YouTube channel. <laughs> you know, so I think that some of it is that the the more te technologically literate you are, the more you miss the little things that the people who don't have that information um, don't get. You know, so we need that we need that kind of direction and it. it I, I interrupt only because if this is your new, if that becomes a, a recurrent focus, it, it maybe it's a good place for you to think about how you want to do that. Yeah, and you just thank you for the feedback. You didn't interrupt at all. That was my last bullet point. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I heard that. <laughs> what else can I talk about with you? Another question, just um, ideas. I just wanted to compliment on you, like as a branding manager, I think the brand image of the library is very strong in terms of like everything from the font to the color palette, walking around the library, like those are those subliminal messages that it feels to your point earlier, like it feels familiar. Um, I love getting the newsletter. I, I love reading about all the library. I do. I, it's like, I, I it's like my little thing. I just love it every month. Like I remember reading this one. I was like, oh, what, what are each of the librarians reading? Like my, what I like from so yeah. um, I think it's a really impactful, like you said, it feels like a magazine, like it just invites you to read it. So I think it's really good. Mm -hmm. um, I know when I went through the board packet, something that I wanted to see in terms of the social media, I noticed that LinkedIn wasn't on there, but we do have a social media presence on there. Because I think it captures a different audience than say like Instagram, it's a different type of engagement, right? So I think it might be worth capturing any of those engagements to see something or following it. And I know I've asked about TikTok, and here just to see, but um, in terms of demographics and younger users, that might be something to look into. But um, TikTok is what the teen interns are interested in. Yes, so exactly. There's some crossover there. Yeah, the for sure. Um, and you know, I know what my um, company had a lot of uh, lesson plan trends. So I don't know if it's quite appropriate for you know, um, playing on the content or whatever, but there's very specific demographics and different age groups that they used to So I think it's, it's really good. I think you've got good branding. I have a question on that line too, just in terms of as we think about the different demographics at Skokie and those people who are speaking in different languages at home, I I just keep trying to figure out some kind of way that we can embed those languages in our materials without immediately translating it into English. It's not for the English speakers, it's for the person that speaks that language. You know? And how do we do that? How do we find that way? Just putting in those tidbits of things so that if I'm a person that's reading that is more, fun, I see it, I'm like, oh, they said I can do whatever, you know, just 
short and sweet. And if, if you're an English speaker, well, you care, you know, paying attention to it anyway. You know, you should keep going. So I, I just think that we have to give more primacy to other languages and find a way to do that. We have done a little bit of very, very recent experimentation that I think was very successful. Um, my colleagues in learning experiences with a program that was in Farsi and we did include Farsi description on the event listing online. Um, and I believe that's in the September, October newsletter. Which I haven't looked at all of the events, but I believe we will include Farsi. Um, and we have done some flyering also for newcomers club. Um, so it's a baby step. There's yeah. a lot more we can yeah. do for sure. And, and, and I don't want this to sound like a criticism because that's not how I mean it. But if it were me, I don't want to be called the new cover. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't. I'm, I'm here paying my taxes like everybody else and feeling a little bad about being a newcomer. You know, I'm trying to figure out how to not be a newcomer anymore. So I, I think that that becomes part of it too, just that sometimes I think we reach out so much, we push away. I feel like you have are there any other comments or questions? Okay. Um, I know that, I don't know, I mentioned it at another meeting before, but just um, looking at other avenues of social media, for example, like warfare, that might reach out to some of the demographics that you can't necessarily you know that don't actually you know typically use like Instagram or Twitter or Facebook, uh, but things like WhatsApp or any one of those platforms that maybe you know are out there that might reach some of those demographics that you can't necessarily get to in those kind of things. Um, when we talk about you know a widening campaign at that right and, and many of those those other um, features. So I know that that's something that's kind of just in my head I've been thinking about, you know, is how we can be reaching out into platforms that they are using, you know, that, that, that are out there that maybe I might not be using, but others might be using. I, that's very interesting. I'd be curious to know, I'm familiar with WhatsApp as a messaging mm -hmm. platform. I'm less familiar with how brands might be using it. So if you have examples that you think are very Yeah, similar, I can, I can take a look at that, but I know that that's something even that's come up like in my work. Just um, reaching out, you know, whether it's um, you know both text messaging or something like that as a way of communication, mm -hmm. even if it was just a one-way, you know, communication tool. Even, um, but I know that it can be used as social media features. Um, I'm not as well versed in it, but I'm happy to look with you. If we can, yeah, you know, look yeah. at it together. If there's a way that we can maybe create something together. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And Jane, I want to say thank you also for the newsletter. I think it's excellent. So kudos to you and your team. I really like the evolution to learning more about staff members as well. Mm -hmm. That's been a really wonderful thing to see the last couple of years. So thank you also for that. Um, regarding the website, I think you mentioned that either internal or maybe even some external consultants might be helping us to continue to look at that and how we might uh, continue to refine that. You know, we have so many amazing resources and um, however, you know, we can look at that to say, how do we educate people about what all is on there? Mm -hmm. Because we have such a, a wealth of resources for our community, like everything from career development to skill development. And, you know, I know we invest quite a bit in these resources. And I don't think that everybody necessarily knows that these things are there for them to use for free with their Sophie library card. I know I hear people who live in Evanston and other neighboring communities and they say, we don't have that. You guys have that. I wish I had a Sophie library card. So however we can, you know, I've always thought if we could showcase in here, you know, we have different things we showcase in here, maybe we could have a little column that says, hey, have you looked at Linda? Have you looked at this? Um, there's so many. I, I have a friend who recently did a whole helping um, seniors, uh, like a whole course that she got a certification for. She's a social worker. She was delighted. She actually did two on health and nutrition. And it's remarkable. 
what you know we have access to. So, so maybe something like that every month, so people know. Wow, you know, talk to your librarian, and we'll help you to, uh, you know, teach you how to use it. Yeah, thank you. And and Devin, while we have you here, um, quite often, like in our different plans and our strategic plan, we usually have a paragraph that says, "The Skokie Village has this many people. You know, this is what makes us unique. Um, if we saw some of these gaps today, this is how many of our households speak more than one language, etc." I would love to see somebody give us an updated version of that. You know. Um, some talking points so that when we're out in the community, we know this is how many people are currently in Skokie. The latest census says this. This is how many of us speak foreign languages. Um, in the last report I saw, it did say like 70% of the people. I think it's just astounding, right? Maybe now it's like 50 or 60, but I'd love to know what is the latest census data on that. One, it's great for the community for us to know, and then two, of course, it informs strategic planning, future budgeting and investments. So, like Devin said, we'll show, we'll make sure that you receive the presentation slides that you use, and we'll look at some of the other data that's out there, and then package that into either a little cheat sheet for the board. That's what I'd like to see. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Can you capture search terms on the library um, website? So, for example, like in the month of May, the most popular search term was business book or something. You know what I mean? That way we can kind of see like what people are looking for. I have some challenges because the catalog is a better catalog. So I you're see. searching bibliophonics, we lose the thread of like our analytics. Okay. I can tell you about search terms if people are toggling to search the website itself. Okay. But when we get into bibliocommons, then we need to work with our vendor to get that information. I believe we can get that information on demand. I'd have to speak with our um, access services assistant manager about what we can and can't get from the vendor. Okay, I think it kind of dovetails off of what you were saying earlier. Like if people are on the website, I'm curious what they're looking up on, like because that could also help point to resources that maybe we under index over, over index, you know, like just to kind of help. <laughs> Richard, just to follow up to that stat sheet, that summary about stats about our community, um, I know the village sometimes when we look at the village newsletter, they also will sometimes have that type of data. I just like to make sure that you know what they're presenting, what we're seeing, that these are the same, hopefully. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's always in quotes too, so I mean, it might not be the same. There is, it's a little bit varied, but on our website, under about, yes, on the records we maintain page, is this sort of general blurb that you're talking about that yes. covers overall population and demographics, a little bit of surf, you know, makeup of the library. So if you were ever desperate for that, you could I've find seen it on that the record. Past, but at this top of mind now, because we just looked at this latest um, census data, even though it's from. <laughs> <laughs> But still, so I just want to make sure that all these data points, you know, that we have whatever is the most accurate up to date that we can possibly have. Thank you, Devin and Jane, for all your Thank presentation. You. Thank you. Graffiti oh, 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 off our pictures, too. <laughs> 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 Thank you so much for both of you. Thank you. And, and I think it's clear, you know, that they're doing. You're welcome to stay, or you know, I understand if you want to leave, uh, enjoy the night. That's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stuff is coming up. I know. Nice stuff. Richard, I'm going to wait to make a video. Did you say at some point that I saw the video about it? Were you the one holding it on there? Some, um, no, it wasn't. Okay. Don't have. Computer access. Okay. 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 I, I guess I'm, I'm just thinking like in the village newsletter this week, they're talking about the fact that there's support for people to get uh, money for, you know, broadband internet access or even buy uh, digital equipment. And it's like, who would know? 
So I thought, if that were the case for people in our computer centers, then maybe some signage somewhere would say, hot off the presses, you know, if you're looking for this, here, here it is, you know, I mean, or here's a, a potential. Yeah, source. I, I mean, I think our information service is a So much of the village, we can help you out of like their the new training program for people for employment. You know, these programs that they're uh, subsidizing. And I'm like, who would know? You know, <laughs> it's not like that. And that's our dilemma as well. How do we get the people who need to know to know? I mean, that's an eternal question. <laughs> yeah, know, I think yeah. That, that we will never reach. Uh, oh, don't any, say that. <laughs> well, I think I would, we have technology like this um, communications, marketing, promotion, but it's never 100%, right? Mm -hmm. So there's always someone who doesn't know. That's like, that's a challenge, right? Okay, the next thing on the agenda is a tax levy uh, distribution through collections. I assume this is for information. Yes, yeah, this, this is only. Yes, exactly. I think well, this is provided every year at this time. Blight prepares this uh, information. It just gives you a snapshot of what we collected um, and how, how much of our expected collection we received. Blight, I don't know if you want to say any more about it or if there are any questions. Does anyone have any questions? I did, yeah. Okay. I want to make sure I understand. So, if we look at the um, fiscal year 21 22, so we've got um, spring and fall, and we have the current year collected, prior years collected refunds. So, just can you explain to us the prior years and the, the I, refunds? I started to break this out because I think the first year I started here, we had a, a large reduction when, when we looked at the total collections. And what happens is the county sends us money, you know. Um, and they actually break it down, of which I track on an Excel spreadsheet. So I thought it was important information for the board to know. Um, if I'm talking about taxes collected prior year. It's just from, it, you know, it could be from 2019. I get, I've got money from 2007 that I don't know how they collected it or why it's been so late, but the county has given it to us. And in terms of when they do their property tax appeal board or when they do some other kind of refund. So the line that says tax refunds prior years, that's money that they've identified to me that reduces actually our collection. But they put it in a format that every time I get one of, one of their spreadsheets showing a total amount that's deposited into our account, they list out the detail. So I choose to track the detail. Yeah, that's helpful. It's another word that I've seen years in other financial statements, capture prior years so that oh, like, okay. I don't know if that helps but yeah but it, and quite correct me if I'm wrong but this might help the board understand this thing too but my understanding is that that the prior years whether it's collected or the refunds is almost impossible for us to predict oh, God. So right. it's always just kind of like wait and see right because mm -hmm. actually just recently I've actually gotten prior year money I it's not a refund position I've gotten more right, money right. from the prior years. Now, again, I don't know how they get something from 2019 or rather from 2006, but I've received, you know, money from them from all the way back then. That's, so that's yeah, why it's, it's very, very difficult hard. to be precise about our projections. We call it projections for a reason. We don't know for sure exactly where they will end. Like I'm also curious in the notes at the bottom there, it says for the 2017 tax levy, the village has included a 3% loss ratio for the library. Yeah. What was that about? That is, the county allows you to assume that you're not going to collect like the 13.4 million that we levy, that you won't collect at all. And you're allowed to put it in to recapture the 3% of it. And I think it's when Julian Prendy started, he included that in, our, in the first tax levy that he did for the library. 
Well, we did it for the village. Okay. And, and we have at the same around the same time we asked if this is a possibility for the library's portion as well. And we just so happened to be going to the village at that time. And he said yes, we will for the library's resources. So there's still scope. Does the figure at the top line, 13 million for uh, 21, 22, 474, 986, that include that 3% loss ratio? It does not. That, that is the amount that the board approved for the levy. Right. Okay. So you can think of it that we, we expect not to receive 3%, and mm -hmm. then by, by including the 3% loss ratio, we will capture that. So it ends up getting closer to what our fee said. Otherwise, if we didn't have the loss ratio, it would be closer to 97%. Actually. So then we look at the 21 22 fiscal year. We're looking at that tax levy budget of what Mark just read 13.47. And then we're looking at the gross taxes collected 13.38. And then we see that we have um, a shortage rate of about 92 correct thousand. Okay. Which is pretty good. I mean, very good. If we're getting under 1% there or right around, that's very strong. So the 3% is not factored in that at all. That's the actual. That's the actual. Yeah, that's the actual right. levy. Yeah. The 3% more well, loss ratio is almost like this it's a, invisible thing it's in the background. It's, right. Like that but it makes, makes us whole, though, because it's actually like an estimate. And when we come up with just 0.69, less than what we levy, it's good that we have the 3% because we're basically cutting whole. Yeah. Well, in the, in the final determination of the gross taxes collected, the 3% is not factored in, right? In our, in our, let me, I'm not sure what you're asking, but let me try to explain it. But it, when we're trying to figure out how much we, we will have to spend, we usually uh, are pretty confident that we can get close to the actual tax levy budget amount, the top number, yeah. because the 3% loss ratio is in existence. It's in the right situation. If we did if you didn't do that, then you we should basically factor in a 97%. And that's in fact that's what we used to do um, prior to when I became the director of Greg um, came here. Um, and then so we were always kind of factoring you know, say 47% of, of one season's um, yeah, but the, the figure down there for gross class uh taxes collected right, 13 million three hundred and eighty-two thousand. That's the actual money. That's yes, yes, yes. exactly. Three percent is not factored in that. Sorry, I'm not sure what we're trying to understand. How is this? How is the um, the three percent loss ratio? How is that applied if it needs to be applied? So you're saying that the it's village. A, yeah, go ahead. I think I think I'm almost sure it's applied in the tax bills that are sent out to the residents. Somehow the village puts in an additional three percent on behalf of the library, budgeting that in. I think so because I don't. I don't file the levy, so I, I, mean, I can find out from Julian. That's, that's right. Though. Is that right? Is, so a, okay. that's a simple, simplified way of thinking about it. I'm sure right, there's a like a more involved answer that Julian might be able to tell us about, but that's essentially what happens. So that it makes us whole is a way best way to think about. But we're saying we're not actually getting that three percent. So where does that three percent go? Is that just? Well, we are going? getting that three percent. Well, they they factor in a higher levy amount than what we actually. Or so that we are end up closer to where we want to. That's what Mark asked no. at the beginning. And he said, "Is the three percent?" What I'm saying is, the three percent is not factored in this at all. These figures you give us, yes. you give us the actual uh, levy, and you give us the actual amount. That's right. Of the levy. That's right. Yes. Okay. Yes. And the three percent, it just confuses things. That's right. Exactly. It's in the background. You don't need yeah. to know about right. it. It's, it's just, just for your budgetary. That's right. Yes. Uh, purposes. You should assume a three percent. Reduction. So it doesn't mean that it's going to happen that way. And it's not factored into any of these figures. I think the bottom line of the bolded area is the budget is what the, the, the board approves, and then the gross taxes collected is actually the right. 
That's all we can. Yeah. Yes. In about three years. Yes, yes. It just can, uh, okay. complicates things. Yeah. The red herring. And ultimately, seeing this, um, having everybody having gone through a pandemic where we were so concerned about would we collect all of the taxes, this is very encouraging to see that it be collected. Property tax revenue less than 1%. is property tax revenue for a, an organization like ours or any tax body is the best source of revenue. It's the most reliable. Even during the recession, it's data can be almost you know, kind of, it, it'll be there again, so one way or another. Okay, any other questions on this? How, how much are we going to be impacted about the uh, second billing on 21 taxes because it's going to I mean, the assessor is saying it will be very late. We can get into that. It's covered in the part of the discussion on the uh, third floor, but invite jump in if you want. But in, in a nutshell, we do large calculations in our discussions. We know that we'll be okay because our operating fund balance is at, at a point where we can absorb not receiving new tax collections in the fall for a, a quite a bit of time. We're in very good position. We're, I mean, we don't anticipate needing to borrow money or kind of doing other things that other taxing bodies are in a, in kind of scrambling for right now. So it's, we're in very solid position. Yeah. Thank you, Dan. Yeah. Okay. Next question. Yeah. Uh, the next thing on the budget, I mean, on the uh, agenda, is a quarterly investment uh, update, and that's for information. That's right, yeah. This is quarterly investment update. Uh, Blake prepares this actually. If you have any questions, we try to answer after them, but uh, pretty straightforward. Any questions or comments? Okay, thank you. Uh, next is you've got approval of the third floor master plan. Before any of that, you were going to tell us how we're going to pay for this. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, yeah. It, it, we provided, um, Susie and Blythe prepared this binder uh, with critical information in here. So um, if you go to page the third section there, oh, actually, the first section, let's start there. So, I can do this, or if you want to, if you prefer you to walk. Start. Okay, I'll start, <laughs> and Blake will jump in if I'm in. saying something incorrect here. <laughs> um, so um, I'm looking at the page where it says GOF cash analysis. Can you see that? Okay. So basically, what um, Blake has prepared this, and what she's showing showing here, is um, a current general operating fund balance as of the end of June. Is at nine point two million dollars essentially dropping up, minus the December twenty twenty two scheduled bond payment that for uh, principal interest of our, our bond payments for the that pay for the renovation. So that's at nine hundred seven thousand, and then we also subtracted six million dollars for anticipated July through December twenty two expenses. Now that's a very conservative, and by conservative, I mean we are projecting full expenditures, which almost is never the case, right, in, in, in reality. But just to be conservative, we are projecting and including factoring in full expenses paid, and that's um, at six million dollars. And then you see the estimated GOF balance at twelve thirty one point two at the end of the calendar year at two point two point three million dollars. So is everyone with me so far? Okay. After that, we know that we will get it, um, our fall tax uh, collections at some point, right? And so we're we're we have projected right here in January 2023. Might be February, who knows? Uh, might be even earlier. Right? But but we're saying January 2023. Even if it is March, um, we 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 have enough money to um, last us a few months past that. But for the purposes of this um, calculation, we. January 2023 receiving our, our fall collections. So that's what you see added there. And then our January through March expenses at 3 million. And then 
and uh, we have our estimated balance at the end of March. Now, by the end of March, we, we want to be at a certain point um, with our general operating fund balance so that it's before the spring collections come in, which is the lowest point of, of what our, where our balance will be. Our financial advisor, Jamie Rackman, who many of you have met a couple years ago online, uh, recommends having 40% of our uh, general operating expenditures in on hand. So that's like that little sidebar there where it says financial advisor lowest point recommendation. The number we're trying to hit there is $5.1 million, $5.2 million essentially. And you can see that our projected GOF balance at the end of that, at that point is right, it's right on the money. Now, if you continue that um, below the, that blue line there, you see the 2022 levy first installment. In other words, the spring collections come in. That's going to be a little larger than um, the fall collections. And then you factor in some other revenue sources like the per capita grant, the corporate replacement taxes, which is the, uh, the business taxes, basically, the June 2023 bond payment reduction, and uh, again, the expected expenses at the full maximum level for April to August. And you can see then where we would land around June of this of next year, basically, around this time. Yep. Just to explain, the reason why I went out through August and then I have transferred June is because I wanted to make sure that we had enough money till we received our next installment. I, 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 you know, I could have stopped in June but I chose to go out to August because, again, at a lower point, I wanted to show that we have enough we have enough money to sustain us until we receive our second installment, which should come in August. So that's why you have a transfer to, to reserve fund in June, but I'm showing the August expenses. I went a little more conservative. Right. Thank you for that's just to give that extra pay. Right. Exactly. I, I didn't want to stop at June and say, wow, look at this lush balance. I wanted to go to the point in time right before we receive our second installment mm -hmm. to be more conservative. We start getting money again in fall, but in August there's what well, should be enough. We should, we anticipate. Mm -hmm. So that shows that um, you'll have, uh, even at that point, uh, let's say June of next year, we'll have $7.7 .7 million. And you can, if you, even if you factor in a transfer to the reserve fund of $2 million, uh, just like the board uh, transferred 1.5 last month, if we do 2 million next year, we'll still be at 5.7, 5.8 million dollars in the general operating fund during the summer of next year. Right. And then we'll, on top of that, get all of the fall collections, kind of as expected, right? So, so that's why we're saying that we can transfer 2 million over. Now, the way this connects to the renovation potential project is. If you look below that horizontal line where it says reserve cash analysis, you'll see our current reserve fund balance. A couple of um, uh, costs that we know are going to be there. There might be more. There's always unexpected stuff, but those are the things that we know about the elevator repair and the concrete repair that's actually happening right now. Our estimated reserve fund balance is at the 8.4 by the end of the calendar year. If we transfer over 2 million in the summer of 2023, will be at around 10.4 million. If we subtract the 5 million that we, in our, according to our finance policy, would want to have at all times in our um, reserve fund, that leaves us with 5.4 million to spend, essentially. That's, that's how we uh, ended up with that number. So that, that happens to cover the full option number one and that I went from alluded to in the memo of related to the investor plan. So that's that's kind of the how we pay for it. Yeah. If there are any questions about that, please let me know. Did I miss anything there? In our assumptions, because I was going to use something about salary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean we can talk about that in more detail in the closed session. I think because that relates to collective bargaining strategy. But but um, I'll just summarize by, by saying, generalize by saying, we believe that we can absorb uh, salary increases and factor in, like, not just salaries, but the estimates incorporate those assumptions. 
Well, and one factor on that will be a discussion about the tax levy, which you know, has to be in public session, of course, but um, is scheduled for August, September. And I'll, I'll summarize our my thinking on this. I think we can make it work. It would be a lot easier if the board approved some tax levy increase, and what exactly that might be um, is, you know, we can talk, discuss. But you can see from our previous discussion of the uh, the past uh, five years, we've been, you know, the board has not approved the tax levy increase for say, 2017, so we're working still on those numbers. Uh, we haven't increased the tax levy budget since in five years. And and if for we, a good reason, you know, and I'm not trying to dispute the. Uh, if we just so that they have a basis for going, if we increase the tax level by 1%, mm -hmm. we're going to get about another 34000 correct? Yes. Yeah, if, yeah, if you can say it. So 2% would be 268. Exactly, yeah, right around there. So these numbers are assuming we're going to increase the tax No, these numbers are yeah. not factoring any of these. If the board approved the tax levy increase of 70%, you know, it's one, three, whatever, that will just be um, kind of needing to be factored into all of these fluctuations. But we wanted to give you a, a look at everything as it stands without any type of tax increase. Is there any concern with inflation and possibly going into a recession about our capability to be able to collect the tax amount that you have? As I mentioned before, when we talk about the tax collections as a revenue source, we looked during the pandemic, we had a concern about that and we were very cautious and conservative with our spending and, and we're watching that to see that first year of that pandemic, what the uh, collection would be and it ended up being very high. We basically got a very, I think it was 98% of our collection, or our budget. We, during that time, we look back to the recession years of um, like a, you know, 2000. That's where I was going because I feel like a recession is very different than what happened. With well, the I mean, it's still economically kind of like yeah, yeah, yeah. times, right? So we we did look at the last recession numbers, and even back then, I think they were at 97 percent. Okay, so that's so, good to know. Um, some some taxes may be delayed, but what we in talking with our financial advisor too. What we came to understand is that even if someone doesn't make their mortgage payment or tax payment, that there is a bank behind that, right? And they're not going to let the property you know, kind of you know, lose the property, right? So okay. they're going to take care of their obligations. So, um, and we'll ultimately, as a public taxing body, get that money. Okay. That's how we see it. I just want to make sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's a really important question. So, should we talk about that with our construction manager last month? Yes. Right, where we asked about inflation and what would that do possibly to all the cost estimates? Right, right. Especially given that we're not even looking at starting construction until 2023, sure. yeah. maybe even taking it to 2024. So, I don't know if you've had any subsequent conversations with him. Well, I think in the my understanding is that um, and Josh Campanelli from SMC is online right now. And, um, if if uh, in the budget in the renewed budget uh, revised budget numbers, they were very conservative. At SMC, what I like about them is that they're always conservative in their projections because they don't want to discipline us on the uh, the works, right. So if anything, they'll come back better. But Josh, can you speak to that? Like, is the budget? Are you there, Josh? I am. Yes. How you doing? Um, if if um, if there's a, just a, obviously a financial recession, economic recession, and 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 costs go up, and and kind of how would that disrupt um, the the numbers that you and John provided us with the budget? Yeah, I know you can't predict the future, but, but, but two yeah. scenarios: inflation, and then the second scenario: the recession. recession. Right. John did put a factor on the, the, the last revised budget he sent. Um, he, he put an additional percentage on that uh, to to allow for for that. You know, I, I don't know what exactly may happen if we if we do dip into a recession. Uh, you know, sometimes it depends because sometimes bids, you know, um, contractors get hungrier and bids actually 
get better, but we have to account for the material increases that are happening. So I feel like, you know, when John and I reviewed that, we did account for that. What happens, Josh, um, I know all of this is theoretical, but what would happen potentially if inflation continues and we don't even begin construction until 23 or, you know, continuing into 24? How does that affect um, the pricing? Like, when are these prices locked in in terms of material? Yeah, well, we, we most certainly wouldn't be locked in until we actually bid it out. But I, like I said, um, you know, John and I put an additional factor in uh, for bidding this in spring of 23. Um, so that, and I think, I think that was noted. I thought we, we noted that in the budget. Um, so at least we're, we're trying to cover the library up until that point. Um, you know, past that, I, I, I don't think any of us really know, you know. Josh, I think you had a 9% escalation. That's what you're referring to, right? Correct. I'm sorry, Richard. Yep, 9%. I think I think we increased it 5%. Thank you. You're welcome. The question that I have is that looking at the options for the third floor renovation, if we were to go with the full out, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. Are we in a position to be able to say that we don't have any more potential infrastructure requirements. You know, it's sort of like we did the big renovation, oops, roof, <laughs> you know. Or, so the, it's sort of like, are we at a point where we're sure in terms of the building that this renovation will not take us to a discovery of something, something else major that well, has to be done? That's a good question. I just want to clarify, um, the roofing project replacement was a known thing. We knew that we were going to, so it wasn't like a, something that we didn't factor in. It was, it, it's been factored in for many, many years now. Okay. The timing of it, um, we just did one year early. So just okay. want to clarify that. Um, I, I mean, Josh can speak to this too, but from what I've learned over the years, when, when you do a renovation, there's always a possibility for discovery of other issues. But that's actually not a reason not to do a renovation. You want to know about those things. No, absolutely. So we, I absolutely. think that I can't answer that by saying that the definitive we're good, you know. But if you really think of um, our, our building review and our 10 year projection, um, almost everything that's on there that's of real significance in, in, in terms of cost is related to the third floor. Um, other than that, it's all just kind of like maintenance stuff, you know, like redoing the flooring or the renovated spaces yeah, okay. at some point, yeah. you know, things like that. So if we do the third floor renovation, this entire building will have been renovated outside the petty. Yeah. So that's a, a petty is one thing. And then mechanical things, you know, like um, boilers, chillers, Andy, we've just been dealing with, uh, we have two chillers, and Andy has been working with our mechanical contractor to an HVAC contractor, because the first one, the older one, is is giving us some problems, and we're thinking we might have to replace that, you know. That's an if, or like a maybe, we don't have, we haven't um, did that out yet, we don't know the cost, so I can't tell you today, but we always have to factor in some possibility. Yeah. So I, I guess I, I raised that because that's not factored in now, right? Um, what do you mean? In terms of the projections that you that yes. are uh, in the package, right. we haven't factored in what any major other thing. You already got a reserve. No, we have so we have we if we took on this project, we would by the start of the project, we would have five million in reserves. Okay. So and and that's a very how should I say this? It, it's it's a very strong reserve, you know. So I don't think that should be treated as kind of like zero or whatever, you know, it's five million dollars. So and well, also, yeah. if if the our wonderful government officials in the county screw up again next year, there's a delay in going out, sending out as a tax bill. We're going to end up using that five million dollars, right? Maybe it's it's entirely possible, and that's why the board has a policy of having that. That uh, we we always want to protect ourselves, right? but. 
We don't want to be in a position where there are other taxing bodies today that have to scramble to get funding for. Yeah, I understand. That's why we got the exactly. five million. I will say that five months, right? Five months, uh, of, five months of operating projected expenses. operating expenses. Yeah, and I will say one other point. By the time we, if we, if the, we move forward with the third floor renovations, by the time we get to the summer of 2024. We there's potential to do another transfer if if what history kind of is if the trend is um, the same. Right. I mean the, 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 the danger area is going to be uh, whether or not county screws up again uh, in terms of setting up the dashboard. But we have to wait. We've got to finance uh, five years of the future, and not get into five months of the future, mm -hmm. not get Right. That's right. I mean, I'm not going to speak of, about the county. Uh, wow. it, it's possible that um, they, there are problems, of course, with tax collections and distributions. But I, from what I've read about the current situation, it is a very unique situation with software upgrades and with all that, you know. And so, yeah, but it happened eight years ago too. Right? Well, that was a different thing, but yeah, I mean, it, it's possible, you know. But, but then ultimately, we get that money, you know. The, the yeah, yeah. But it's, How long was the delay then? About the same. No, the delay wasn't that long. Um, in 2000, we had to borrow money. Right, because you guys now have you have the policy. Right, but right. back then, I don't think it was as long as it is now because they're talking about going into next year, but they swear, you know. Um, that it's not going to because that means people will not be able to take their tax payments. Right. If they don't have the money in by December, that means you can't take that tax payment as a deduction in this year, oh, and wow. you could be over the limit next year. So that's why I think it was an article by Tony Preckwinkle. I they say December, but we've still put it out to January. You know, we did the projections till January. A lot of people would be upset. If they oh, didn't a have yeah, a lot of people. Right. So, the question: Did this library have to borrow money? Yes, we did. We from, 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 who? From, from, from the village. From the village, and it charges interest. Yeah. Which is why you guys now have the policy, right? Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> why. That's the, the policy. The policy was created right after. Five right? months of operating. Yeah, five expenses months of operating expenses. expenses. Mm -hmm. Which is a good policy. I thank you for that right. policy. Yes. <laughs> thank you. It's a great policy. Yes, it was a lot of foresight. I guess my other question is along the lines with um, Doreen is, you know, we had talked about um, the petty renovation. Is that something that then we'll anticipate putting on hold until after the third floor? Well, the petty is, um, and and how dire of a need is it to continue? Yeah. I think um, what I would say about the petty is that as it is, it's a functional space. It's not the most accessible space, but I don't, from talking with Josh, John, Andrew, and Alex, I, I, we don't have a solution to make that entire skinny area accessible because of the, the scope of the, the top of the bottom. So, so um, we talked about possibly um, increasing the landing platform on at the top of the petty where we can increase talk about handicap. Yeah, exactly. For wheelchairs, stroll, uh, walkers, that kind of thing. In terms of like how dire it is, you know, like I, I would like to replace the flooring and install the hearing loop uh, system. Uh, that's that would increase accessibility, that would be more inclusive. But you know, the seating is uh, almost a, you know, that's a want, not a need. I mean, the seating has been left to us forever. Those chairs are indestructible. Like, really, they are, and it's almost a, it's like, you know, like I'm thankful for that, but also they're not, you know, theater cell seating. You know, they're on a wish list. Yeah, and, and even if you do the theater cell seating, it would cost quite a bit of money. But there would be some drawbacks, like it would reduce the capacity of the party. Mm -hmm. And maybe the cleaning would be more applicable thing. So as it stands, I would like to do the flooring and maybe um do we vamp the lighting, which isn't I don't see as like a massive capital expense. You know? um, so I, I, I don't know why we're talking about the 
I mean, we haven't got well, well, Michelle, yeah. if, if that's yeah. uh, how, how much of yeah, a Yeah, like, is that, that something is, that we yeah. do need to be budgeting for? In the future. If that's something, well, if that's something that if we're projecting out between now yeah. and 2024, and that's something that we're planning on doing in the next year and a half. Yeah. But, uh, well, well, that's why I'm don't. saying is, can we rule out three years? Well, so let me just say one thing about that, though. Oh. The, the petty, depending on what um, is needed, if we do like the kind of what's needed and not what's wanted, you know, we could probably take that and, um, out of the capital line within the operating budget, okay. which is from um, our factored into our normal expenses up that are anticipated for the sheet that we just went over. So it wouldn't come out of the reserve necessarily. So keep in mind we always have a, a bit of you know, like several hundred thousand in our capital line in our normal operating budget. We actually have 370 left for this fiscal year. That could, that could definitely take care of the flooring. And actually, well. I think in our projections, we have something for the petty. It might just be the hearing loop, but we have something factored in for the petty. Not yeah, the seats, in our, obviously. In our uh, projected capital project? Yes. Yeah. Do you know how much would that be? Josh, do you, do you remember how much the hearing loop would be for the petty? I don't know. If, uh, John shared that with you. I can't recall if that number was given. Yeah, I apologize, Richard. I don't have that on me. Uh, I could get that for you right away uh, tomorrow morning, but I don't. I don't have that on me. I, I apologize. And I, honestly, I don't, I'm not even sure we've ever asked you for it, so it's, it might be an unfair question. May I have your attention, please? I want to say that. May I have your attention, please? Let's wait. <laughs> the library will be closing in 30 minutes at 9 p.m. The public computers will automatically shut down at 8.45 p.m. Please save your work now. If you have items that you wish to borrow, please check them out at this time. Thank you. So I appreciate the question because as we look at everything tonight, including events, event attendance, it's important to look at the facilities that we have, you know, and, and are they are they um, what we need them to be, right, to keep moving forward with our plans. So, so it's, it's good to know what is on the wish list and what is on the need list that's helpful. Well, I don't think we should make a decision tonight. Uh, this is a lot. There's a lot of money here. We've got a lot of unknowns. We have a, an unknown labor contract. We have unknown effect of the recession. Unknown potential inflation. Uh, we have this chiller that they have to be replaced with the And uh, whatever we do with the penny, that's that's on my wish. Uh, the other thing we ought to take into consideration is tax levy. I mean, uh, it could be a combination of reducing uh, how much we spend on renovation. One option of elimination would be doing that. So we might be another fifteen thousand dollars. Yeah, what is that option two or something like that? And you combine that with tax levy of maybe two percent, gives us another quarter million dollars or so, and that increases the cushion. So you got the eight fifty and the quarter million, quarter million. You got more of a cushion, you know, in case there's some unknown event that's going to occur. So. Unless you want to push forward tonight, my advice is we think about this. Read over the material. Have all your questions ready for next time. Then we'll make a decision next time. And we'll have to decide whether we do the whole thing, some part or none of it. All of those, and we ought to take into account what we're going to do with the tax level. I don't think you can do Two of them in a vacuum. Anybody else? Thank you. 
anybody disagree with that? I think the tax levy is a good piece of it. Well, okay, and then, and then the issue is do we do a tax levy? But I'm saying that's got to be. That's yeah, part of the, I agree. The part of the speculation. That's part of what's going on with this is what we're going to do with a tax levy. That's going to give us just a, some more money. As a reminder for especially the new trustees, in August of every year, there is a discussion of the tax levy, and then in September, we always ask the board to vote on the tax levy. And that's because we need to get that information to the board in order for them to include it in their program. Uh, so, um, so that's the rationale for them. And when was the last time we had a tax levy? Four years ago. 2017 was the last time it was increased, so we're still on that number that we increased. Okay. So that would be, if we say flat, it would be five years or so. Okay. And a 1% tax levy increase would increase the amount of revenue we take in by 1% of the figure at um, uh, page 28 of your handout. Look at the top figure the, the uh, tax levy budget 13 million 474. You see that mm -hmm. we increased it one percent, that would give us 134,000 dollars more. Mm -hmm. It's two percent, would be 268,000 dollars more. So, I mean, we've got to discuss the tax levy, the pros and cons of doing a tax levy, and whether we should do it tax levy in connection with this project and whether we feel that's necessary to put in some kind of a cushion yeah. Yeah. we have what extra there, money. What happens with the, the levy, the, not so much the levy, but the tax collection in terms of our the library payments during that period when there were so many foreclosures? And, I was talking about that earlier, like the tax collection historically have been remarkably steady. But then the bank, whoever, the bank, if the bank takes the property, they exactly. still have to pay the tax. So that stays consistent. Right from now, our research historically, we haven't right. seen any period where it was kind of outrageous. Like we lowered the budget when COVID came out. We lowered the budget because we thought there would be a situation where some uh, residents wouldn't be able to pay their taxes. Okay, so we lowered the budget to factor that in. It turned out we didn't have to because basically the taxes got paid. Uh, 97, 98% of the taxes got paid. So we got our, we got our money. We were fortunate because then all the other taxing bodies, you know, locally and nationally, they're relying on sales. Tax or other corporate revenue, those suffered. But real estate tax collections is steady. Thank you. I, I, any other comments? Or? Yeah, I'd like to know uh, because the second option is not really that. Mm -hmm. uh, I can remember going up there, and to me, they looked like normal bathrooms. I know. Because I was used to anything uh, efficient, put it that way, in the bathroom. Is there something that I missed? Is there some glaring problem with the bathroom? A big part of it is that um, so the women's restroom, from what our uh, conversations with staff have told us, is that they're too small to act in themselves. There's not a lot of privacy in those restrooms. Uh, they're not inclusive. We're not, uh, we don't have any gender, or all gender options for the staff. But we do have them on the second floor. Yeah, on the first floor. First one. Um, a lot of staff over the years have you know, asked us, you know, they commute to work, they ride their bikes or whatever, and they ask for like a shower facility. That's a luxury, I think, but it would be nice. So, I mean, overall, I agree that not completely, but for the most part, they're functional. If 
if we delay that, I, I think we could get by. It's not, I mean, I would like to have cold weather uh, restaurant renovation as well, but because, um, you know, it's also nice to do everything all at once while we have contractors on site. Uh, but, you know, I understand what you're saying. We have to make a choice. You know, it, it was between nothing and number two. I'd go for number two, obviously. I guess I'm, I'm also just thinking about community perception. And people are hurting. And if this doesn't get fixed, <laughs> you know, in terms of our government and our this and our that and our the other thing that our country is going through, I I'm just I'm I'm not sure how that this project can be made palatable in that context for people. And that that's that's what I'm that's why I bring it up in that sense. And I don't know whether it's that's necessarily uh, an important consideration at this point because it's not really the public areas, you know what I mean? But by the same token it is the public money. So I I well, this is gonna get publicity. The public's gonna know we're spending Four point something million dollars or five million dollars. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I appreciate that. I think that's entirely valid to raise that point. And two years after we spent seventeen million dollars really free after yeah, the library. Yeah, we're still paying the bill. Yeah, but I mean, yeah. I, I, all I'll say is I understand that. I'm not disputing mm -hmm. that um, the validity of that point. I, I would say the, this public. Our community has been overwhelmingly supportive of the um, $17.7 million renovation project. And I feel like you know, the board, you know, when they approved it at, years ago, um, knew that this was an investment of into 20 years into the future of libraries. You know, in, in, in a similar way, and I'm not, I'm not saying it's exactly the same, but a big part of the library's success is that. I'm just, I'm not even talking about comfort or anything. I'm talking about just the ability to work well here. And our spaces, as they stand right now, you've all been up there. Um, and, and, and you told me, you know, how, how, we, how much they were in need of repair, right? So the flooring, lighting, furniture, ceiling, you know, these things are not um, going away and they're only going to get worse. You know? So I, I feel like that I would like to, the board to consider all of these factors and if there's like a middle ground that's fine but um i, I just hope that we don't ignore or not ignore i know we're not doing that but i don't want to not take action at all because of unknowns because there will always be some unknowns right and and, and all, when all is said and done when we look at the figures we're in very strong financial position so well one other factor Look at that number too. We've never in our history ever had a two million dollar transfer to the reserve. Yeah, I can speak to this. It's not talking about number two. Okay. Uh, yeah, number two. Well, the reason is for two years, if you notice the, the revenue over expenses for fiscal year 20 and 21. We didn't do any transfer at all. So the 1.7 million and then one, you know, almost 2 million, we left sitting in the general operating fund. Right. So that's right. why when I did the cash analysis, I was comfortable with the $2 million figure. But we were spending that money, right? We were spending. Uh -huh. No, no. We, we didn't spend, spend it. Either. That's why our general operating that's, fund is That's, that's why we have enough money to carry us through January because we didn't make a transfer. No, we didn't spend that. We, we didn't transfer to the reserves and we left it because we were fearful of what COVID might do to our collections. So we're, what Beth and I are concluding is that we don't expect to have $2 million to transfer over to the reserve fund every year. This is a very unique kind of place where because of the lack of a transfer um, or absence of a transfer for two years, we are able to make that transfer. That's what we're saying. Okay. 
know kind of offhand, um, or maybe not, maybe this is for a question for another time, but when, how much under we are under our projected budget every single year by the end, are we, because we typically finish off less than what we're projected yes, we, on our budget. We typically, about how much it, I can get the exact average. numbers for you. Mm -hmm. um, although, if we look at the schedule yeah. under number two, the revenue over expenses, that mm -hmm. can be just, you know, a gloss, not a gloss, a overview, but a big overview of it. That, um, yeah, if you look at the, if you add the last two columns, that's how much under the gap there is. Right. And it, it's hard to say, like, what the trend line would be because, um, you know, you'll see some years we had. 300,000 transferred over at 320 left, and another year we had 1.2 million transferred over and 100,000 left. And so that's a big difference. It's a twice the amount, right? But it, well, there are so many factors. There's um, tax collections in relation to uh, previous years' collections with unanticipated um, funds. We, um, corporate replacement tax was very high this past fiscal year, um, unexpectedly high. Higher than what they told us. To it was actually double. double. There, there are a lot of factors. Um, if some years we spend all of our, uh, or close to all of our uh, capital line expenditure uh, mm -hmm. budget in our operating fund, not the reserve fund, but right. our operating fund, mm -hmm. because there are a lot of repairs or, or what, what have you. But and but that's not always the case either, right? So it, there, it's can't predict all of it. You can see, generally speaking, we we take a very conservative approach, and we've never ever had a situation where we spent more than we received. We've always been able to. Um, so. May I have your attention, please? May I have your attention, please? The library will be closing in fifteen minutes at nine p.m. If you have items that you wish to borrow. Please use the self checks to check them out at this time. All library materials must be checked out before we close. Thank you. From my perspective, I'm, I'm actually not. Right? If I had my druthers, we'd do the full whatever, because I think the building deserves it. You know, you can't do what's been done and not finished. So I, I see that, but I I just want to make sure that we're being sensitive. Mira taught me that early on, you know, being sensitive to those taxpayers. I am one of them. And I'm like, what? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. That's, I appreciate these discussions. Well, let me ask you first. Let me get a sense mm -hmm. where where people stand. Does anyone want to go forward with this today? Anyone? Look, I agree with you that it's prudent to have further discussions about the tax levy issue and to see those beginning numbers to see if those okay. areas. I didn't see I'm comfortable waiting to, to continue to think about it. I think that, you know, having this, talking about it, thinking about it a little bit more, asking more questions between now and next month again, talking about the tax levy. I feel like, you know, one month in between for us to think about it so we know that we're going to make, you know, a logical decision. I'm happy to wait on that. Um, you know, because it, it's a it's a lot of money and it's, yeah. it's a big decision, so I'm comfortable waiting. Yeah, I'm with waiting. There's a lot of speculation. And the only caveat I'll throw in is like, I'm fine waiting, but I also don't want to keep punting the ball down the field in like no. six months now. We're like talking about it. I feel like we have to, you know, make a decision. Correct. Yeah. That. Okay. And we also have to make a decision on the tax levy. Right. And I think, I think the two of them are together. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. So we've got those two decisions have to be made. So respectfully, I don't know if that bothers goes back to September, depending on when we can agree on the tax levy issue. No, no, we, we have to do it in August. August. I don't care if in all the years it did in September. We've got to make that decision because I think what affects that decision is is this budget. So the 
whole the whole picture. Mm -hmm. The whole picture we got should have that so all then, at once. So then next month or earlier we need to see those tax levy scenarios. Right. We need to have that discussion. Right. Well we, we have we obviously do have a tax levy memo which has all the breakdown of it. So I'll definitely have that. Mm -hmm. um, but 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 basically from your first cents you're gonna raise it hundred and thirty four thousand. And in, in on page um, in section four, there's a lot of a lot of projections after my memo there, and it, within though, though each page of those projections is if you look at the top line, I don't want to get into specifics here because this is related to you know, uh, I like the drawing information, but you'll see um, the top line is what Where are you section four after the memo. Section four. Yeah. Section four. Yes. After the memo. Yeah. Keep going. I'm just. I'm not talking about oh, in detail. I'm okay. Just. I want to share that in those each page is separate, and at the bottom of each page, there's a little calculated table there of oh, okay. what the one percent to five percent increases would be. So just uh, for reference, that's okay. something we shouldn't discuss. Right, I, but the, I'm talking about the, that one piece of information on that. Uh, We've given you the information, yeah. some of the information that you've been. <clears throat> so I also think, though, it's important that we see the historical uh, figures. Well, I'll, well, I'll provide them. Yeah. Yeah. I so always do. Number square, you can see historically you know, what's going on. I always do that. I'll, I'll provide the full memo and all this background information about the tax levy considerations. So. And, and I did want to just include. Um, and say, and I, I do think it's important that we address the renovations um, on the third floor, you know, especially if you're seeing it, in this beautiful building down here. And I think that, you know, um, so much of the caliber that we have in the programming and our staffing um, and giving a workspace that's going to really continue to reflect that high caliber that we keep at, at this library. So I just want to say we want to you know, I don't. I don't want to push it off forever either. Right? This is something that needs to be addressed. Uh, Josh, in the coming months. Thank you, uh, Josh. Um, can you answer one question I have? I, I know I asked you and John if the board uh, needed more time to discuss and say they approve something in August. You know, uh, would would you need to crunch new numbers with the budget and the timeline? And John, I think replied saying that that should be fine. But um, let's just say, at what point, you know, in the future, would you need to uh, readjust the budget numbers <coughs> and the timeline significantly? If we waited until like September, even or whatever, like it, how how will that affect um, this conversation in the, in the production? I, I think we're probably good with a Richard a, a one to two month um, push, so to speak. But I think after that, you know, I don't know that any of us, as as, as you guys have discussed and and we have with you, I don't know if any of us can predict what what what's going to happen. So I, I think you know we would feel comfortable still being able to, uh, you know, work with the numbers we gave you. You know, with if we push it to August or or maybe even September, but I think after that um, we we may have to reassess. And we want to hit that window to start the construction soon after the summer school project season in 2023, right? Right. Yeah, that was the other the other reasoning for getting started when we did uh, when we were shooting for. So correct. So that's just so background information for the board to consider as well. Okay, that, that's fine. And, and, and I think the next two agenda items, we'll, we'll just carry over table it, right? Because they're uh, moved now. So. Okay, is there anything else on this project before we the understanding we're going to pick it up again? Hearing none, uh, I have a motion to table uh, approve the third floor master plan, approve the architectural fee proposal, approval of the construction management fee proposal. So, 
I'm sorry. Motion to the table. Oh, yes. Yeah. I'm so moving. Okay, we have a second. I think second. Okay. okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, that passes seven up. Thank you. And, and along the way, if, if anything pops up and you want to ask a question about a detail or if you want to come in and just talk to me and try and get a, a, more, a longer explanation on any aspect, please just say the word and we'll just Thank you. Uh, Shabnam, got your report. Anything to add? No. Across the, the, the rails. Thank you. Okay, any questions or comments on that? The rails report. Okay, moving on. Comments from trustees. Any trustees want to make any more comments? Okay, hearing none, can I have a motion that we go into closed session to discuss collective bargaining issues? So moved. Okay, I have a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And that passes seven nothing. 